It's the moment! They are the Football League's finest in 2023! Vincent Company's Burnley are the champions! Identity. In football, the word identity is used as commonly as pretty much any other word you'll find, and of course that does make sense given it quite literally describes exactly what something is. A football club's identity is so often deeply rooted in the culture of not only the local areas but also the entire sport. Think of Barcelona or Bayern Munich and how they're viewed worldwide for example. It's something that is built up over not just days, weeks or years, but more so generations. However, in the last year alone, we've seen one club's identity do a complete U-turn. This is the story of how Vincent Company completely transformed Burnley. On the 22nd of May 2022, a 2-1 loss to Newcastle confirmed Burnley FC's relegation from the Premier League, having been in England's top flight for six straight years. Sean Dyche was in charge for the majority of this period with his gravelly voice making him loved by many, however by no fault of his own, things had become stale at Turf Moor. Each season the club would see very little transfer business, never spending more than £15 million on a single player, something that's massively rare for a Premier League club, with some of that being down to £170 million pound leveraged buyout of the club putting them in significant debt going into the 21-22 season. By January and they'd found themselves in 16th place before a bid of 25 million pounds for their star striker Chris Wood was too much to turn down, who would then be sold and replaced by Wout Weghorst, where following a 2-0 loss to Norwich, Sean Dyche would be sacked after almost a decade at the club with the side 18th in the league and destined for relegation. Three wins and a draw from the next four games had given them hope, however after three losses from four to end the campaign, Burnley would be relegated after 16th, 15th and 17th place finishes in recent years had seen them on the verge of the drop for much of their time in the division. A side which had won the top tier twice and was a founding member of the Football League over 100 years previously, now found themselves over £60 million in debt and falling apart at the seams. Not only did they have an ageing squad but also one where various key players saw their contracts expiring at the end of the season, meaning Burnley would lose them on a free with no clear way of using transfers to clear that debt and then rebuild their squad. Tarkovsky, Bardsley, Lennon, Mead, Peters, Stevens, Hennessy and many many more all left permanently on a free, as well as the sales of McNeil, Cornet, Pope and Collins which were seen as pretty much necessary to keep the club stable following the loss of Premier League TV money. The media were portraying Burnley as a team in despair with a back-to-back -back relegation far from uncommon in predictions as from the outside looking in it seemed as if life was going to be very bleak at Turf Moor. And to be fair, you can't blame anyone who thought this. Even when in the Prem, the club had done pretty much no transfer business and so in a division below with less money, no manager and only 12 senior players at the start of the summer, it did seem like the Clarets were screwed. But then came one special day in June. Vincent, officially now the Burnley Football Club manager. How do you feel about that? Excited. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm proud. I'm you know, willing to, to work hard. I'm willing 15 trophies, a third place finish in the World Cup, countless more individual awards and some of the most important moments in Premier League history. It's fair to say that Vincent Company enjoyed a pretty decent playing career. However, that being said, it would end with a weird season in which he'd be a player manager at Anderlecht before the side's worst start in the new millennium led to him stepping down as manager and focusing on his playing duties. Come the end of that season and Anderlecht finished in 8th, their worst finish since 1937, where Vincent Company would then rejoin his role as manager, this time retiring from playing, as the side finished 4th place in 2021 and 3rd in 21-22, which was their best season in 5 years. Nonetheless though, to an English audience who wouldn't be too conscious of what was actually going on in Belgian football, these results were far from impressive given the size of the club and so when Vincent Company arrived at Turf Moor this time last year, there was a good few people brushing the appointment aside and saying it wouldn't be too long until he was sacked. Scott Twine would be company's first signing, quickly being followed up by the likes of Harwood Bellis, Ian Matson, and Nathan Teller and loan deals, as well as Anna Zururi, Murich, Josh Culling and plenty more, quickly building a strong side that was widely regarded as good enough to at least challenge for playoff spots in the upcoming season. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention that all of that was done at a significant net transfer profit. 
And so with the manager in place, a young and exciting squad built in finance worries eased, Burnley were ready for their opening game against last season's playoff finalist Huddersfield. And with Premier League football not on for another week, plenty of people had flooded in to watch the opening game of the season, where they would be left absolutely gobsmacked. In just a single summer, they'd seen a side go from being known as defensive and boring to an attacking, aesthetically pleasing one. Except, things didn't exactly continue perfectly for the Clarets. Four straight games without a win would then see them drop down to 16th, however in another twist they then saw a truly remarkable run of form. Win after win saw them climb the table, topping the league by mid-October, and by the time the season was reaching its midway point the club had lost just once in 19 games. However then came the toughest test for this Burnley side and it's fair to say that they failed to match expectations. Facing up against Sheffield United, Vincent Company's side shipped five goals, allowing the Yorkshire team to close the gap at the top of the table to just three Three points. However, in true Burnley fashion, they got back up again and kept going. In the following 22 matches, they would lose just once, being promoted with seven games to spare after beating one of the most informed teams in the entire country in Middlesbrough, and they would even win the title at Ewood Park, home of their biggest rivals in Blackburn. A 3-0 win in the final day was also enough to reach 101 points, joining an elite group of clubs to be crowned Centurions as well as knocking Premier League outfit Bournemouth out of the FA Cup earlier in the season, even making it all the way through to the quarter-finals and pretty much all of this success that I've mentioned was down to one man, Vincent Company. I guess in hindsight, none of this should be too surprising given the Belgian's playing career saw him captain both club and country as well as the fact he played under and learnt from a certain Pep Guardiola, even seeing a 100 point season as a player before he did it as a gaffer and so let me take a look at the tactics he used to get Burnley back into the Premier League. Under Deitch, we saw Burnley playing a 4-4-2 with the main aim being to protect their 6-yard box which often saw them stay compact and aim to hit teams in the counter utilising long balls to big men up top for dangerous transitions. And now to be fair to Sean Deitch, it would be unfair to describe Burnley as this team which never pressed, always stayed in their box and so on because that's simply not true. They most often used a mid block and would press far more than they were given credit for, particularly after losing possession. And so it wasn't exactly as big of a shift in style as many people have alluded to, however company has certainly taken the Clarets into a new stratosphere. Firstly, it's important to mention that the Belgian not only set up his side better, but he also simply made the players themselves better, a perfect example being Ashley Barnes. Before last season, if you were to describe the 33-year-old, you'd probably say something along the lines of he's a target man, he's fairly limited technically. However, last campaign we saw him drop deeper, even playing games as a 10, and his ability to press has also improved. If we take a look at the shape Burnley used, they most often started in a 4-2-3-1 similar to this, where defensively company liked to keep them compact in their own half, defending in a 4-4-2 where either a winger or midfielder would push up along the striker to prevent any balls through the lines and to aid in pressing, however it's in attacking phases of play where this team was truly special. In build-up play we either saw both fullbacks invert into midfield or one pushing up the pitch whilst the other one sat alongside the centre-backs depending on their opposition and how they pressed, where once they'd progressed the ball up the pitch Pitch, they'd commit numbers forward, stretching defences and utilising long passing sequences to break teams down. And as well as this, when they lost possession they'd press high to win it back or to force the opposition long, where a strong defensive shape allowed them to begin another attacking phase of play once again. Now I don't know about you, but to me that seems a little bit different to their style of old. And so, what should we expect this season from Burnley? Well, judging from their business so far, they'll look to continue to make smart signings so they can punch above their weight, similarly to what we've seen from Brentford and Brighton in recent years. And before I forget, I do think I should mention the fact that despite initial worries, it does seem as if Burnley's ownership aren't as bad as many expected, perhaps due to premature comparisons with the Glazers over how the club was purchased, meaning I don't think we'll see a repeat of last time round in the Prem where the club became stagnant just a year after qualifying for the Europa League. And so in just 12 months, we've seen Burnley's identity change from a defensive dull team to one of the most exciting projects in world football.